Mr. Speaker, I'm glad to be here in this August House to perform once again one of the most pleasant duties on the calendar of the President of the Republic. That is to give honorable members and the Ghanaian people a message on the state of the nation in fulfillment of Article 67 of the Constitution of the Republic. In accordance with protocol and convention, it is good to see that my wife, the First Lady, Rebecca Akufuado, Vice President Mohamedou Baumia, the South spouse of Mr. Speaker, Mrs. Alice Ajua Jonas Bagben, Chief Justice Kwesi Enim Yabua and Justice of the Supreme Court, Chairperson Sana Uto Sribo II and members of the Council of State, Chief of Staff of the Office of the President, the Honorable Akusia Frima Ose Opare, and officials of the Presidency, the Chief of Defense Staff, Vice Admiral Seth Amwama, the Inspector General of Police, Dr. George Akufo Dampare, and the various service chiefs are all present. Mr. Speaker, the House is also duly honored by the welcome attendance of the former presidents of the Republic, their excellencies John Ajikum Kufo and John Dramali Mahama. The former First Lady, Her Excellency Anakune Dwajman Rawlins, and the Dean and members of the Diplomatic Corps. Mr. Speaker, it is the 8th of March today, and that means it is International Women's Day, the day set aside globally to honor all women. Please allow me to acknowledge and appreciate the significance of the day and heartily congratulate women all over the world, and especially women in Ghana, for the role they play in realizing the dreams, cares, and aspirations of humankind, Ghana. For the role they play in realizing the dreams, cares, and aspirations of humankind and of this great nation. The presence of women leaders at both the local and national fronts have advanced rights, enhanced equality, and in general, improved the living standards and quality of lives of all concerned, including that of men. The theme for this year recognizes and celebrates women who are championing the advancement of transformative technology and digital education. Mr. Speaker, apart from my own personal fond memories as a member of this House, Parliament stands as a symbol of our democracy and its values. It stands as a reminder to all of us that our country has chosen to travel on the path of democracy and at the heart of that journey is the idea that the government can only govern with the consent of the people. Mr. Speaker, it is important that we stress this point because after 30 years of democratic practice, we may be tempted to take it for granted. We need to remind ourselves that our compatriots the majority of whom are in their early adulthood, have no personal recollection of the struggles that got us to this point in our development. In the same way that only a small percentage of our population can recall life under colonial rule. Similarly, the memory of dictatorship, one-party rule and military rule is receding into the dim past and the struggles that have brought us so far are disappearing into the recesses of history. However, because Parliament directly represents the citizens of our nation, 
in this hallowed chamber. It will always be the reminder of those struggles. It is important we never forget that democracy is not a static achievement, but a process that needs continuous nurturing. Indeed, Mr. Speaker, we must remind ourselves that in our country's political history, it is the restoration of Parliament to its proper place that has always symbolized the restoration of power to the people. And they are saying that when constitutional rule is interrupted, it is Parliament that is shut down the other arms of government continue to operate. Thirty years ago, this House convened for the first time to mark the commencement of the Fourth Republic. The early years of the return to democracy were fraught with challenges. The minority side in Parliament today presides as the Speaker. This is no mean achievement. Given the way the numbers shaped up in the House after the 2020 elections, many cynics and skeptics predicted a doomsday scenario for this Parliament. But instead of a meltdown, we have witnessed considerable cooperation and unity of purpose among all parties and factions. This is to a large extent a measure of the maturity of our political culture and democracy. We will need even more of such bipartisan maturity to meet the challenges confronting us at this time. Today, we live in a country in which we enjoy complete freedom of expression, freedom of association, freedom of assembly, freedom of religion, and political affiliation. Indeed, freedom of speech has now reached such heights that even members of the diplomatic corps feel able to join in our national discourse <laughs> and pronounce on matters and pronounce on matters that will be problematic for Ghanaian diplomats in their countries of origin. Nevertheless, Mr. Speaker, it seems to me the important thing in our free speech environment is actually to try and hear each other instead of raising the decibel level of our individual points of view. Mr. Speaker, to come before this House to deliver a message on the state of the nation is a simple and practical demonstration of accountability. I always treated the occasion with the utmost respect. This address offers us, as usual, the opportunity to provide an honest assessment of our country's situation and seek the support of all in addressing it with hope and confidence. Mr. Speaker, when we make it an assessment, is a symbol and practical demonstration of accountability. And I always treated the occasion with the utmost respect. This address offers us, as usual, the opportunity to provide an honest assessment of our country's situation and seek the support of all in addressing it with hope and confidence. Mr. Speaker, when we make it an assessment of what the state of the nation is, it would necessarily have to include what state it was in yesterday, the state it is in today, and what state it will be tomorrow, based on reasonable grounds of expectations. How far back should we be looking to make a judgment on the state of affairs today? Mr. Speaker, I believe that the issue above all that is quite properly dominating the concerns of all Ghanaians is the gravity of the economic situation of our country and how we can quickly stabilize the economy and work our way back to the period of rapid economic growth. Our currency has been buffeted. 
Our inflation rate has been very high. And for the first time in our lives, debt exchanges have become the language of everyday conversation. As such, Mr. Speaker, I wish to make a departure from the usual format of messages on the state of the nation and concentrate predominantly on the economy, which will enable me nonetheless also to make some statements about the state of our agriculture, education, energy, health, infrastructure, mining, tourism, and security. This is not to belittle the contribution of the other sectors to the growth of our country. But I believe the exigencies of the moment justify the position I am taking, particularly as all sector ministers continue to provide official updates on happenings in their respective sectors. I've said, and many others, including the managing director of the IMF, have said that our economy was doing well until COVID-19 and the war in Ukraine was doing well until COVID-19 and the war in Ukraine took us off course. Mr. Speaker, I will be heard. Hansard has to record me. I will be heard. Maybe because of the severity of the present difficulties, or maybe because it suits their preconceived agenda, some people are unwilling to accept that we were on a good trajectory until the arrival of COVID-19. The Ghanaian people, however, accepted this proposition is evidenced in the results of the 2020 presidential election, which were unanimously endorsed and upheld by the seven-member panel of the Supreme Court. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, allow me to go on a short trip down memory lane and remind ourselves what things look, back, look like back at the beginning of 2020 when I came to this House to give an account on the state of our nation. This is what I told this House on 20th February 2020, and I quote, Mr. Speaker, in three years, we have reduced inflation to its lowest level, 7.8 percent in January 2020, since 1992. For the first time in over 40 years, we've had a fiscal deficit below 5% of GDP for three years in a row. For the first time in over 20 years, the balance of trade, that is the difference between our exports and imports, has been in surplus for three consecutive years. Our current account deficit is shrinking. Interest rates are declining and the average annual rate of depreciation of the CD as it is lowest for any first-term government in the Fourth Republic. Our economic growth has rebounded to place Ghana among the fastest-growing economies in the world for three years in a row at an annual average of 7% GDP growth, up from 3.4% in 2016 the lowest Honourable members, three please, decades. may we listen in silence. Sovereign credit rating agencies have upgraded our ratings and, imp and also improved the outlook for this year, notwithstanding the fact that it is an election year." Unquote. Mr. Speaker, that is where we, are, we were at the end of February 2020. Three weeks after this speech, in which I expressed our sympathies and solidarity with China on the difficulties they were having with the new virus, our world changed. The virus I refer to arrived in our country and in the rest of the world with a vengeance. Within weeks, 
we were in the middle of the lockdown. Our airports and land borders were closed. Schools and factories and even markets were closed. The hospitality industry was brought to its knees. Our economy, like much of the rest of the world, went into a tailspin. The virus I refer to arrived in our country and in the rest of the world with a vengeance. Within weeks, we were in the middle of a lockdown. Our airports and land borders were closed. Schools and factories and even markets were closed. The hospitality industry was brought to its knees. Our economy, like much of the rest of the world, went into a tailspin. We took many decisions, and we did many things which, according to the science, were the most reliable and trusted ways to save lives and livelihoods at the time, which may look strange and unnecessary today, but that is from the safe perspective of not waking up to, che to check on the COVID-19 infection or death rate. Indeed, there were some who suggested that we cancel the national identification registration exercise and even postpone the 2020 general elections. Who would have thought that today anybody would be questioning the fumigation of schools and markets? I recall vividly the straight talking I received from a group of our most eminent physicians and other scientists on the urgency of fumigating all public spaces, including offices, schools, hospitals, markets, churches, and mosques. The few who could afford it even fumigated their own homes. Today, the science might be that such measures make no difference to the spread of the virus, but criminality or reckless spending cannot be ascribed to the decision to undertake such measures. Mr. Speaker, you might remember that we could not produce Veronica buckets fast enough. Today, it is not an obligatory item on anyone's list of purchases. In dealing with the crisis generally, I did not meet anyone brave enough to suggest the considerations of money should be a hindrance to anything we needed to do in the fight against the virus. I was, and I am grateful that the people of Ghana rose to the occasion, and together we went through the crisis and came out well by defying the doomsday predictions about the inevitability of dead bodies on our streets. I'm grateful that we saw the wisdom in helping each other and I thank those who contributed their expertise, time, and energy to the fight against the virus. And I thank those who contributed to the COVID-19 fund that was set up to help us meet some of the expenditures. The economic consequences from the pandemic have been devastating. Mr. Speaker, it is precisely because the economic fallout from the pandemic is so widespread and long-lasting that it is important to show clearly that the COVID-19 funds, COVID funds were not misused. It is critical that we do not lose the confidence of the people that a crisis that they were led to believe we were all in together was abused for personal gain. Mr. Speaker, it was government that asked for the COVID funds to be audited. And I can assure this House that nothing dishonorable was done with the COVID funds. The responses, the responses from the Ministers for Health and Finance on January 23rd and 25th, 2023, respectfully, have sufficiently laid to rest the queries from the Auditor General's report, and I believe any objective scrutiny of these statements from the Health and Finance Ministries would justify this conclusion. We did provide 
518 million CDs of grants and loans to micro, small, and medium-scale enterprises through the NBSSI, now the Ghana Enterprise Agency, in which 302,515 enterprises benefited. Over 60% were women-owned. These were MSMSEs that were in distrust, in distress as a result of the pandemic. For some traders, the receipt of 1,000 CDs made the difference between the ruin of the household and survival. In addition, 58,041 health workers were empowered to supplement the existing health sector workforce. Subsequently, all of them have been absorbed as permanent workers in the health sector. Frontline health workers were also granted 50% tax relief for the period. Was that something to regret? We should for be ever grateful for the work that so many people to did to keep all of us safe. All households enjoyed free water supply and huge discounts on electricity bills because access to water was a necessity to ensure people adhere to hygiene practices and access to electricity was important as everybody was encouraged to stay at home. It also provided an economic cushion to provide to protect lives and livelihoods at a time of difficulty. Today, the government's support for utility bills is being projected by some as a waste, or to use that word so beloved of some commentators, profligate. The Speaker, the government took a deliberate decision to try and keep the inevitable disruptions across all our lives down to a minimum in the education sector by opening schools and education institutions as soon as it was made safe to do so. It was an expensive undertaking and not universally popular. But faced with the prospect of a whole generation of our children losing irreplaceable years of education and the real likelihood of many of them dropping out of school, however, forever, we took the brave decision to open the institutions. Even then, it is worth pointing out that the school year has not yet fully returned to the predictable pre-COVID calendar. After the event, some might be tempted to forget the volumes of sanitizer and other logistics it took to keep the schools open and safe. In much the same way, as some might now choose to forget the vitriol that came from some who should have known better, threatening hell and damnation when, according to them, the children start dying in the schools. Mercifully, we did not lose a single child to COVID in school. I would like to suggest that with the best will in the world, Mr. Speaker, no auditor can put a figure on the cost of keeping the children in school safely during that crisis, nor the continuing cost of the effect of the pandemic on our young children. Not the financial cost, not the emotional cost, and certainly not the social cost. But we must thank the Almighty that we have survived to repair the damage and begin to rebuild our economy. Beyond the use of COVID funds, there are legitimate questions being asked about how the country's debt situation got to where it is. Mr. Speaker, let me state emphatically that we have not been reckless in borrowing and in spending. Honourable members, honourable members, honourable members, it's not yet your time to say, wait until that time arrives. Please, I, honourable members, I will allow spontaneous reaction to statements.
but I will not allow debate of the statement. <laughs> Your Excellency, you may proceed. It is worth noting that the debts we are serving were not only contracted during the period of this administration. Mr. Speaker, we have spent money on things that are urgent, to build roads and bridges and schools, to train our young people and equip them to face a competitive world. Considering the amount of work that still needs to be done on the state of our roads, the bridges that have to be built, considering the number of classrooms that need to be built, the furniture and equipment needs at all stages of equipment, of education, considering the number of children who should be in school and are not, considering the number of towns and villages that are still Considering the number of towns and villages that still do not have access to potable water, I dare say no one can suggest we have overborrowed or spent recklessly. Yes, I have been in a hurry to get things done, and this includes massive developments in agriculture, education, health, irrigation, roads, rails, roads, rails, ports, airports, sea defense, digitization, social protection programs, industrialization, and tourism. We can be justifiably proud of the many things that we have managed to do in the past six years. As I go around the country, I hear the pleas for more roads, schools, hospitals, and as the rainy season comes, I wish, as every other Ghanaian does, that we would have built more drains than we have. And I wish we had the resources to do more. But Mr. Speaker, I'm proud of the amount of work that we have done, especially in the road sector. Roads constitute the largest number of questions asked in this House by members of Parliament. A large amount of the monies we borrow are for road construction. Shall we dare stop constructing roads? Mr. Speaker, I would like to state categorically that this government has built more roads than any government in the history of the Fourth Republic. And Mr. Speaker, and Mr. Speaker, the details of all these roads are attached in the annex to this message. I have done so because last year when I made a similar pronouncement, I was met with howls and gasps of incredulity from the minority benches. And so I thought it appropriate this time to present it as an annex to the statement. Which will be part of hands up. Beyond the construction of roads, Mr. Speaker, this MPP administration has implemented successfully a national identification system with the Ghana card, constructed more railways than any government in the Fourth Republic, established the Zongo Development Fund to address the needs of Zongo and inner city communities. And under their auspices, we have conducted more infrastructure in the Zogo communities than any other government in the Fourth Republic. Constructed more NCA licensed fiber optic cable than any other government in the Fourth Republic. 90%, 93% of the total. Increase the, increase the proportion of the population with access 
to toilet facilities from 33% to 59%. Increase the number of public libraries from 61 from independence until 2017 to 115 in 2022. Provided more equipment, vehicles, ammunition, etc., to security services than any other government in the Fourth Republic. We have successfully implemented the digital address system, improved significantly the financing of governance and anti corruption institutions like the Ministry of Justice and Office of the Attorney General, the National Commission for Civic Education, SRAJ, IOKO, and the Office of the Special Prosecutor. Implemented the One District, One Factor initiative. In four years, in four years, 106 companies are in operation under 1D1F. 148 factories are under construction. This is the largest expansion of that sector since independence. Constructed more fish landing sites than any other government in the Fourth Republic. Established Africa's first national scale electronic pharmacy platform. Provided free Wi-Fi to 700 senior high schools. 46 colleges of education, 260 edu district education offices, an initial successful pilot of 13 public universities. Introduced drones in the delivery of critical medicine, vaccines and blood to people in remote parts of the country. And today, Ghana has the largest medical drone delivery service in the world. with zipline distribution centers in Ominako, Mpenya, Vobsi, Sefiwoso, Ketekrachi, and Enum, and overseen an improvement in revenue collection with the introduction of an EVAT and e-invoicing system. For example, figures from 19 taxpaying companies onboarded onto the EVAT system reveal total recorded monthly sales increasing from 222 million CDs in November 2021 to 720 million CDs in November 2022. Again, in December 2021, total monthly sales of 284 million CDs also saw a huge increase to 1 billion CDs in December 2022. Indeed, the evidence of how state funds have been used to improve our society is all over the country. No district or constituency has been left out. And I believe and I believe there are many Ghanaians who will vehemently disagree when some say there's nothing to show for all the funds that have been at my government's disposal. Mr. Speaker, I would like at this stage to brief the House on how the talks with the International Monetary Fund have been going since the announcement on 1st July 2022 of our intention to engage the IMF for a funded program. Mr. Speaker, having reached a staff level agreement on 12 December 2022, after five months of intense negotiations and completion of most of the prior actions required under the agreement, we are on course for the IMF staff to present to the IMF Executive Board Ghana's program requests for a $3 billion extended credit facility by the end of this month. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, the three-year IMF program anchored on government's post-COVID-19 program for economic growth. Eight aims at restoring macroeconomic stability 
and debt sustainability whilst protecting the vulnerable. It is a strong reform program which relies on front-loaded fiscal measures to increase domestic resource mobilization and streamline public expenditures to support inclusive growth and enhance social protection. Mr. Speaker, I thank the House for its support throughout this process, including the passage of key revenue laws. However, a few more of these measures, namely the Income Tax Amendment Bill, the Excise Duty and Excise Tax, tax Stamp Amendment Bills, as well as the Growth and Sustainability Levy Bill, are outstanding, which need the urgent attention of the House and passage to complete the prior action. This will put us in readiness for our presentation to the Fund Board and, more importantly, bolster our, our domestic revenue mobilization efforts. Mr. Speaker, it is clear that given the extent of the fiscal and debt sustainability issue we are addressing, fiscal adjustments and structural reforms are not sufficient for restoration of debt sustainability. A critical component of the measures we are implementing to address the current economic crisis is the debt operation involving both domestic debt and external debt. The debt operation is aimed at returning the country to debt sustainable path by 2028 by reducing the debt to GDP ratio on a general classification basis and in present value terms from 103% in 2022 to 55% by 2028, and reducing the external debt service to revenue ratio from 29% in 2022 to 18% by 2028. Mr. Speaker, in order to achieve these goals, the decision was taken to execute a domestic debt exchange program. In addition to fiscal adjustment, external debt operation, and structural reforms. The participation rate of 85%, representing tendered bonds of 83 billion CDs, out of the total eligible bonds of 97.7 billion CDs, constitutes significant success for the DDE program. The 83 billion CDs bonds that were successfully tendered also represent 64% of the outstanding domestic debt of 130 billion CDs at the end of December 2022, as pension funds have been expressly exempted from the DDEP. I want to take this opportunity to thank organized labor, pensioners, pension fund managers, the Ghana Association of Banks, the Ghana Securities Industry Association, the Ghana Insurance Association, the Individual Bondholders and Retirees Forum, and all others who have contributed to make the debt, domestic debt exchange program a success. Mr. Speaker, I know it has been said over and over again in the past weeks, but the voluntary nature of the DDE program bears repeating as is the fact that the government is committed to honoring all coupon payments and maturities in respect of both old bonds and the new bonds in line with government fiscal commitments. Mr. Speaker, we're also making progress on the external debt negotiations since the government announced an external debt service suspension on 19 December 2022 for certain categories of external debt to ensure an orderly restructuring. This suspension is an interim emergency measure toward a comprehensive external debt operation which will contribute to the restoration of our debt sustainability in line with our request for debt treatment under the G20 Common Framework. I want to express our appreciation to members of the Paris Club and to the People's Republic of China for the cooperation they have so far exhibited to us in attempting to reach an agreement and in their attempt to establish an official credit committee. We look forward 
to their fast-tracking the needed financing assurances for IMF approval. We are confident that with their cooperation, we will reach our March deadline for going to the fund. So, Speaker, we remain resolute in our vision to restore macroeconomic stability and promote inclusive growth. Mr. Speaker, government recognizes that sustained growth must be deliberate, especially in a global landscape marked by forces of technology, trend, trade, and intense competition. It requires a combination of leadership, social cohesion, and deep investments in core capabilities of people, firms, and institutions to harness our opportunities. That is why together with our private sector counterparts, we're anchoring Ghana's medium-term growth drivers on competitiveness, integration, adaptation, and digital innovation, all aimed at raising per capita GDP from the current $2,500 to $4,500, aligning with the Ghana Beyond Aid Charter by 2020. Mr. Speaker, concluding the arrangements with the fund will not restore our fortunes overnight, but it will set us on the road to recovery. With fiscal discipline, we will regain the trust and confidence of our business partners and the investor community, which will give us space to continue our productive plans and policies. However, in addition to our engagement with the fund, we're also seeking and implementing some original and innovative ideas to try to solve our problems. For example, the gold purchase program by the Bank of Ghana and the goal for oil policy are creative uses of our resources, which are already bearing fruit. These policies are aimed at achieving two results that are critical to the health of our economy. Firstly, they will help us preserve foreign exchange, especially the U.S. dollar. And secondly, they will enable us to stabilize the price of oil products, such as petrol and diesel, on the domestic market. We have already seen some success on both fronts, with the price of U.S. dollars and petroleum products falling since we announced the policy and, and began to implement it. The average price of petrol at the pump which had risen to 20 CDs a litre in the middle of December 2022, is now 13 CDs and 80 pesos a litre. The price of diesel had risen to more than 23 CDs and, and 70 pesos a litre and is now selling on the average at 13 CDs and 80 pesos a litre, which is a reduction which is a reduction of almost 10 CDs a litre. We expect, we expect this trend of falling fuel prices to reflect soon in our daily lives, since transport fares affect the price of everything. I hope the trend of prices going up and down, going up and coming down, become a regular feature of our retail economy as being demonstrated in the fuel prices. Because as we all know, prices, especially of petroleum products, used only to go up in our country. I do worry about the external expenditure on security at our borders, but we do not have a choice but to spend resources to keep our borders safe. We do not compromise on the safety and security of our nation. And my first responsibility as your Commander-in-Chief is to keep all of us safe. The foundation, the, the foundation for all development is the safety and security of our nation and its people. The reality of the state of affairs in our neighborhood demands that the government goes to great lengths to ensure the security, safety, and stability of our nation. The threats of terrorism and violent extremism surrounding us require that we pay maximum attention to protecting our borders 
and working in collaboration with our neighbors to keep our country and the region safe. This is the prime motive for the Accra Initiative, which is already yielding results. Mr. Speaker, I'm able to cite here some of the equipment we have produced, provided the military to help them protect us all. Allow me to list a few. The Army has received 104 armored personnel carriers, 70 utility troop carrying vehicles, 20 armored vehicles, 85 assorted Toyota vehicles, 50 Ankai buses, 40 Jeep Jade vehicles, some explosive ordnance disposal equipment, large quantities of communication surveillance equipment, varying quantities of weapons and four unmanned aerial vehicle systems. And the Ghana Navy has taken delivery of four offshore security vessels and four Zodiac boats. We've also continued the process of upgrading the housing needs of the security services. The Barracks Regeneration Project Phases 1 and 2, the Military Housing Project Phases 1 and 2, and the Ghana Military Academy Infrastructure Project are expected to be completed and handed over by the end of May this year. Mr. Speaker, we continue to pay attention to the police service. We can now see more of the police on our streets in the urban areas. Ever so gradually, driving on our roads is becoming more orderly. I note that even motorbike riders now stop at traffic lights. Things are improving. <laughs> 504 housing units comprising 72 one-bedroom and 432 self-contained units have been completed for the police service. Recently, I delivered 100 pickups 600 motorbicycles and six armored personnel carriers to the police service to boost operational capacity. For the first time in our nation's history, the police service has dedicated helicopters to help with its operations. <laughs> the Speaker, I must share some good news with the House. I am particularly proud of the dramatic intervention government has made to tackle the long-lasting and utterly disgraceful problem of dilapidated and inadequate number of courts in our country. Many of the courts have not been fit for purpose and do not provide suitable facilities for the efficient administration of justice. The inadequacy means that people have to travel long distances to gain access to courts. As someone who for years earned my living as a practicing lawyer, I have first-hand experience of the unacceptable state of courthouses around the country, and I'm glad to inform the House that we are resolving this problem. Through the Ministry of Local Government and the District Assembly Common Fund, government has embarked on the construction of 120 courthouses with accompanying accommodation for judges across the country. Indeed, 60 have been completed, and the others are at various stages of completion. For the first time ever, we have the happy situation of purpose-built courthouses with accommodation that are waiting for judges to be appointed put to put them to use. Six new regional high courts fitted with judges' residence are, so, are also being constructed in the new regions, i.e. Ahafo. Bono East, North East, Oti, Savannah, and Western North. Three of the courts, that is those in North East, Oti, and Savannah, have been completed and commissioned. Those in Ahafo, Bono East, and Western North regions will be completed by April. This week I had the present duty on 17th October 2022 to commission a new modern court of appeal complex in Kumasi, together with 20 townhouses and a guest house to serve as permanent residences for court of appeal judges based in Kumasi, who are mandated to handle appeals 
from the northern part of the country. The Asante, the Asante Hine, Otunfo Saito II, who generously gave the land, was present at the ceremony. It is a truly magnificent sight, and I recommend it to honorable members who go to Kumasi to pay a visit and see it for themselves. In addition, 210 vehicles were well, earlier in 2022 distributed to all judges in the Supreme Court, Court of Appeal, Higher Court, and Lower Courts. Mr. Speaker, it is a well-known fact that in this administration, TVET and STEM feature frequently in all conversations about education. Technical and vocational education are being given the place of honor they deserve. Since the realignment and in introduction of free TVET, enrollment in TVET schools has increased from 15,000, 13,000 in 2021 to 47,000 today. And all the indications are that this is a trend that will continue. In 2022, the TVET service recruited 3,400 staff, the highest in the history of TVET in Ghana, to accommodate this development. I was told last week about young, one young person who was placed in Achimota School in the current place, school placement exercise and has turned it down to go to a STEM school. I think we are making progress. The strides we're making in education are already changing lives and changing the narrative. As of this year, nearly two million young people have benefited from the free SHS policy. Predictions that the policy would lead to a lowering of standards proved wide, very wide of the mark. On the contrary, the results under the free SHS have shown a systematic improvement and as a result, two million young people have either found a way to further education, training, apprenticeships, or employment because of the free SHS policy. I'm proud of the educational, additional educational infrastructure, especially the provision of ultra-modern classroom blocks for several schools, which are equipped with laboratories, ICT centers, and, lab and libraries. The establishment of 10 STEM centers across the country, including one in Accra, to aid the study of engineering and robotics. Construction has also started at the University of Agricultural Science in Bunsu in the Eastern Region. Mr. Speaker, apart from the enhancement of revenue and the judicious use of resources, we are all agreed that we need to do something about our huge import bill. Last year, I set up a five-member ad hoc cabinet committee to work on a policy to enhance domestic production and export development with a fourfold strategy. Two, one, reduce the country's import bill in the short, medium, and long term. Enhance domestic productive capacity in selected products. Generate widespread employment opportunities. And four, diversify and expand our export capacity to Africa and beyond, especially through the vehicle of the African continental free trade area. In 2021, Ghana's total import bill was put at 13.7 billion United States dollars according to GRA icons. On the evidence of existing local productive capacity, we have identified a list of 20 priority products in the categories of primary agricultural products, processed foods, and manufactured goods, we, where we can confidently enhance domestic production. Amongst these are rice, fish, poultry, fruit juice, sugar, tomatoes, vegetable oils, oil palm, fertilizers, pharmaceuticals, soaps and detergents, insulated wire, ceramic products, corrugated paper and paper board, cement and clinker, and motor vehicles. The report on the implementation modalities to enhance domestic productive capacity in these products has been prepared. And once confirmed with your approval, the new Minister for Trade and Industry 
will roll out urgently a series of initiatives to implement the policy. I want at this stage to make mention of one particular program that is to be introduced by the government to address the needs of the youth and women, the Youth Start Program. This program seeks to support young entrepreneurs to gain access to capital market training and technical skills, compliance and quality assurance support, and business development support services that will enable them start, build, and grow their own businesses. Mr. Speaker, the Youth Star program was successfully piloted in 2022, with 70 youth-led businesses benefiting from the initial 1.98 million CDs. Subsequently, a total of 288,800 applications have been received and are being processed by the Ghana Enterprise Agency for full operation. Mr. Speaker, government remains committed to infrastructure development. Working with the private sector, we continue to explore the use of public-private partnership arrangements as a financing alternative to the delivery of critical public infrastructure such as the Accra Tema Motorway Extensions, Accra Takradi Motorway, and the Sugan Kopilumi Transboundary Water Supply Projects. In addition, Mr. Speaker, the 750 million United States dollar Afro-Exim Bank facility, which has been secured, will make it possible for us to construct many other roads and interchanges, including the long-awaited four-tier Swami interchange. Mr. Speaker, we have now reached the point where we feel the impact of technology as an irreversible way of life. We have digitized many processes. The Ghana card has become a one-stop shop for Ghanaian identity and its usages. We are fully convinced that our embrace of an investment in information technology and the digital infrastructure will help us to redefine our traditional concepts of time, space, speed, and nature of conducting business within our society, economy, and culture. Information technology helps all segments of society to be integrated and transformed through connectivity in facilitating the production, distribution, and consumption of information within the whole economy and society. We have integrated many processes within the digital environment. And for this, we have to recognize the efforts of many component parts of the government, such as the Ministry of Communications and Digitalization, the National Identification Authority, and especially the Vice President, Dr. Al-Hajim Mahoud Mahoumiya. who I understand has been nicknamed E. Baumia. Our need, our need for technological reinforcement within all our structures and spaces are unending, and we will continue to push the frontiers of our engagement with the technologies of information, economic development, and human transformation. We must be chaired by the improvements being made in the National Health Insurance Scheme to make access easier. The scheme is currently one of the better digitalized institutions, and I hope they get the public support that they need. I know in particular with satisfaction that they have developed a self-enrollment mobile application, my NHIS, to self-enroll in the scheme and this enables registration and renewal for oneself and others by blinking NHIS cards to Ghana cards. In 2022, over 5 million members' data was linked to their Ghana card to enable them to access health care using the card. The National Health Insurance Authority has also improved its claim management processes with an emphasis on e-claims and paperless systems at all four claims processing centers. In the year under review, electronic claims processing was about 70% of all claim submissions. As of 31st December 2022, the scheme 
paid a total of 1.014 billion CDs to health service providers. Mr. Speaker, our drone delivery service is firmly established. In Ghana now has six centers with zipline drone services, making Ghana the largest area logistics distribution network in the world. Zipline, through the national scale drone delivery services, has delivered some 14.8 million units of life-saving medicals, vaccines, and blood products to health facilities in Ghana by the end of 2022. Childhood vaccines top the list with the delivery of 8.3 million doses, followed by 2.05 million doses of COVID-19 vaccines. Mr. Speaker, I must say, however, that the current shortage of some childhood vaccines in the country has concerned me greatly. This shortage, if prolonged, will affect negatively Ghana's childhood immunization program, which has been recognized as one of the most successful in the world. The WHO has only recently expressed worry about a steady decline in measles vaccination coverage globally because of the concentration on the fight against COVID-19. In accordance with our desire not to become part of this global trend, government has taken steps to ensure the stocks of these med vehicles, va vaccines are procured and supplied as a matter of urgency and emergency. The Ghana Health Service has developed an elaborate program to catch up on children who have missed their vaccine immediately stocks arrive. The Speaker, I want to encourage all parents and caregivers to ensure that eligible children are vaccinated once this program begins. No child should be denied access to vaccination. Mercifully so far. Mercifully so far. Mercifully so far, not a single child has died as a result of the outbreak. This House has already passed into law the National Vaccine Institute Bill which is yet to be brought for my assent. In the near future, this institute will ensure that no matter what happens to the global vaccine supply chain, we can produce our own vaccines locally. Mr. Speaker, government continues to prioritize agriculture as one of the driving forces for economic transformation. The experiences and lessons from the COVID-19 pandemic and the Russia-Ukraine conflict justify sufficiently our increased investment in the agricultural sector. Indeed, the sector recorded significant successes with an average growth rate of 6.28 percent from 2017 to 2021. This consistent growth over the period has translated into improved food security, job opportunities along agricultural value chains, and availability of raw materials for industry. To address the vexed issue of post-harvest losses, we have constructed some 65 warehouses with the remaining 15 at advanced stages of completion. This intervention is adding some 80,000 metric tons to national grain storage capacity. 29.9 million United States dollars worth of machinery and equipment have been procured from Brazil to boost mechanization. Government will this year commence preparatory works for establishing a tractor and backhoe load assembly plant in the Ashanti region and continue capacity building of operators to ensure effective management and prolong the lifespan of agricultural machinery. Mr. Speaker, the impact of climate change and variability on global agricultural activities is a call to all of us, and indeed all countries, to adopt appropriate technologies and other innovative practices for sustainable agriculture and resilience against food insecurity. The government's response, among others, has been to continue to invest in irrigation infrastructure, both large and small scale across the country. In 2022, government completed the rehabilitation and modernization of large-scale irrigation schemes at Tonno, Bong, 
and Bangladesh Bank projects. The three schemes are expected to provide 6,760 hectares of irrigable land for all year round crop production. Phases one and two of the Tamne irrigation project have also been completed, with phase three of the project at 57% completion. Mr. Speaker, we are now at the most difficult stage of electricity provision around the country. The parts that are left are the very difficult to access area. The national electricity access rate increased from 79.3% in 2016 to 88.54% in 2022, making us amongst the top six in Africa. And we're still expecting to achieve the 90% universal electricity rate by 2024. To reduce transmission system losses and voltage fluctuations and to improve the overall quality of power supply, Old lines are being replaced on the western, eastern, coastal, and middle corridors. It is worth noting that three new substations have been commissioned between 2021 and 2022, thereby improving reliability and efficiency. Mr. Speaker, I'm pleased to inform the House that the Electricity Corp Company of Ghana, ECG, has since the last quarter of 2022 embarked on an aggressive digital transformation program. In the first phase of this program, set to be completed by end of April 2023, the focus is on creating a cashless and efficient payment system. I'm pleased to announce that on 1st March 2023, all ECG district offices became cashless. This is a major achievement by all standards. Since the start of this transformational program, we have so far seen a 25% increase in the monthly revenues. The second phase of the program will see the digitization of postpaid bills and the digital tagging of all meters. In our estimation, these initiatives should increase the monthly, the monthly revenues of ECG by some 40% before the end of this year. I firmly believe that the initiatives, which have been so boldly rolled out by ECG, will make revenue leakage a thing of the past and address consumer pain points in their interactions with ECG. Mr. Speaker, we continue the fight against Galamsey with the support of the security agencies in the short term. However, we're determined to promote responsible small-scale mining through community mining schemes. So far, 16 of these schemes have been commissioned, with three more to be commissioned by the end of this year. All these schemes are supported with gold catchers, pieces of equipment designed to help small-scale min miners to extract gold from the ore without the use of mercury. In 2021, I launched the National Alternative Employment and Livelihood Program. The program employs several youth in the production of seedlings and reclamation of degraded mine lands. Currently, reclamation is going over 1,000 hectares of degraded lands in Ashanti, Eastern, and Western North regions. Mr. Speaker, on the international front, I should state that having gained a seat as a non-permanent member of the Security Council for the years 2022 and 2023, Ghana, as one of three non-permanent African members, is working vigorously to push the African agenda, which includes the fight against terrorism and the reform of the UN Security Council. I'm pleased to state that good progress is being made on the reform of the UN Security Council. A U.S. President for the first time in the person of President Joe Biden and the French President Emmanuel Macron have both embraced the reform process. It is our hope that the leaders of the three other P5 members of the Security Council will soon do the same and help bring about this much needed reform that will bring greater effectiveness to the work of the United Nations 
and the Security Council in the maintenance of international peace and security. We continue to be active members of the African Union and ECOWAS and support strongly measures both bodies have taken against unconstitutional changes in government in our region. We're working with our partners in the region to strengthen regional cooperation in the fight against the terrorist menace in West Africa, hence our commitment to the Accra Initiative. Mr. Speaker, our decision to prioritize tourism as a key policy for economic diversification, job creation, and growth is clearly paying off. The World Economic Forum Report of 2021 Travel Index ranks Ghana as the number one tourism destination in West Africa. The potential contribution of tourism and the arts to GDP is therefore one that we must nurture and emphasize. Both domestic and international tourism are rebounding significantly from the severely disruptive impact of COVID on the travel and tour industry. International arrivals nearly trebled last year from a low of 355,000 158 in 2020 to over 915,000. Domestic visits to tourist sites are also up by over 55.7% during the period. All these have been made possible by deliberate marketing initiatives and upgrades of tourist infrastructure by the Ministry of Tourism, Arts and Culture and its agency, the Ghana Tourism Authority. The Beyond the, Year, Beyond the Return initiative, which I launched in 2019 as a sequel to the Year of Return, has reignited excitement about Ghana as the hub and the mecca for the global Pan-African, a home every person of African descent must visit at least once in their lifetime. A few days ago, at a historic ceremony in Washington, D.C., we conferred Ghanaian citizenship on Mother Viola Fletcher and her brother, Uncle Red, 108 years and 102 years respectively, two of the only three living survivors of the Tulsa Massacre of 1921. In May this year, I'll be chairing a tourism stakeholder retreat on rethinking tourism for national development and job creation. I've tasked the ministry and its agency, the Ghana Tourism Authority, to work on the modalities to bring together all the stakeholders within the industry. Over the next couple of years, my government will deepen even further our efforts to make tourism a strong primary source of growth for the economy. Mr. Speaker, Monday was 6 March, our Independence Day. And this year, we had the main celebrations in the Volta region. I made the decision to rotate the Independence Day anniversary celebration in order to enhance the cohesion and unity of our nation and to make it to clear to all segments of our population that we are all part of the One Ghana project. I'm glad to inform the House that it was a happy and grand event set against the breathtakingly beautiful background of the Adaklu Mountains. Mr. Speaker, 60 years since our independence, Ghana has taken steady strides to become a more developed country. The Ghana of 1957 is not the Ghana of 2023. We've come a long way since the days of our 6 million population, with very few modern amenities for its people. Today's population of 32 million, with a growing stock of modern infrastructure, spanning drones to supply our medicine, to the Ghana card which identifies each of us as proudly Ghanaian. As President, I have championed the innovation of policies and the execution of projects that have helped improve the quality of life of the Ghanaian people. And God willing, I'll continue on a path that brings the most benefit to the people of Ghana. Mr. Speaker, things may be dire today. Nevertheless, we must count our blessings. Our petrol stations have fuel and will be spared long winding queues to fuel our vehicles. 
Our markets and shops are, by the grace of God, well stocked. And we have not been faced with the prospect of the rationing of basic necessities, such as fruits and vegetables. Our children's schooling has not been interrupted. We have continued to provide free SHS, free TVET, and paid teacher and nursing training allowances. Our electricity, our electricity supply has been consistent, and we have been spared the hardship of doom so during such a trying time. Our country continues to be stable and at peace. Throughout history, there are many instances of nations going through periods where dark clouds create shadows that momentarily shield the yearn for vision from sight. Such moments should not be ones in which despair takes over. Such moments call for strength of character, sense of purpose, and an abiding commitment to the general good. Mr. Mr. Speaker, honorable members, fellow Ghanaians. Let us believe in ourselves and in our capacity to overcome the problems that are before us. This is a phase, and with every fiber of my being, I am certain that this too shall pass. We have done it before, and we will do it again. May God bless us all in our homeland, Ghana, and make her great and strong. Mr. Speaker, I thank you for your attention.